Two minus ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We have liftoff. Go Super Heavy. Go Starship. Thanks for all the historic flights, Pad One. I guess it figures that the one morning that I wasn't watching a Starship test flight would be the morning that Starship would perform perfectly. Well, as perfectly as it had up to that point anyway. Everything that SpaceX wanted to accomplish in Starship Flight 11 came to pass, and came to pass pretty much as well as SpaceX could have possibly imagined. From the liftoff to the hovering of the super heavy booster over the Gulf, to the re-entry, to the survivability of the heat shield, to the smooth splashdown, or the smooth really landing, I would say, in the Indian Ocean, the whole thing went extremely well. But all of that having been said, I am always the kind of person who tries to bring us back to reality, to bring everybody back to Earth, especially with headlines like this. Well, yes, SpaceX possibly is flirting with perfection if we're talking about suborbital flights that aren't really deploying any orbital payloads. Well, because suborbital flights can't deploy orbital payloads. When it comes to where Starship was supposed to be at this point in its development, that is to say 11 flights along, Starship should have been much further along in its development process by now than it actually is. And that doesn't bode well for 2026 Mars missions or especially the upcoming Artemis 3 mission and every ambition ambition that NASA has for the moon. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Okay, Starship fans, before I get all of you absolutely seething with anger, as you generally get when I start talking this way about Starship, let's go ahead and talk about the positive things, because there were quite a few of them. Pretty much everything went flawlessly with this flight, again, as far as the things that SpaceX wanted to accomplish. The liftoff was great. The hot stage separation was really good. The descent and splashdown of the super heavy booster, again, demonstrating very precise control. I don't know if I'm a huge fan of hovering it that far over the Gulf. Really, I think that if they want to catch this thing over and over and over again, they really need to get a little bit more practice in actually simulating a capture rather than having, having it hover a substantial distance over the water. But all of that being said, everything went so well during that part of the flight. And then as far as the suborbital flight was concerned, everything went well there as well. There was a relight of the engine. They talk about using the Raptor engines to re-enter the stage, in other words, to properly dispose of it or to simply re-enter the atmosphere in order to recover and reuse the upper stage in the future. But in addition to that, using these Raptors in orbit is going to be extremely important for re fueling in the future. Starship isn't going to be able to maneuver to the point to where it can start using its RCS thrusters to dock with another Starship for a refueling mission unless these Raptors perform well in space. Once again, that went really well also. And then the deployment of the dummy satellites once again, this wasn't an orbital deployment. These things burnt up shortly after being deployed, but still it demonstrated that the Pez dispenser on Starship seems to work well also. 
The thing that I found to be the most significant, however, about this flight, the biggest step forward as far as Starship development is concerned, was the re-entry. We didn't see flaps and fins being chewed to pieces by plasma. We didn't see the heat shield suffering near as much damage, although looking at all of the different perspectives, all of the different camera shots that we got of this landing in the Indian Ocean, there definitely seems to have at least been some damage to the heat shield, but still, I could actually see this thing possibly being reused in the future, assuming, of course, that it didn't blow up in the ocean, but if it had been captured, if it had actually been able to carry out a successful landing somewhere, say on a barge or something like that, I would say that this ship might have had a chance of being reused at some point in the future. A little bit of damage to the skirt, a little bit of damage to the heat shield, but still perhaps salvageable. And that's something I'd like to point out here. The reason that I get annoyed when the media or anybody else talks about sticking a landing, sticking a landing, I don't like it when they say that because this is not sticking a landing. However, what happened yesterday unquestionably is sticking a landing. And those are the sorts of distinctions that we need to make when you're talking about something as precise as rocket science. I mean, this is the kind of vertical landing where I could actually see Starship successfully coming down from an orbital trajectory to setting down on a landing pad or being captured by a tower and surviving and surviving sufficiently intact in order to be reused again, which of course is the whole idea. This was a huge step forward. This was a fantastic splashdown, whatever you want to call it, in the Indian Ocean, and the heat shield really did quite well. Again, I don't think it was completely untouched, but it survived so much better than any heat shield we've seen thus far. All of that having been said, though, now that I've said all of those positive things, we need to talk about reality in terms of where Starship is compared to where Elon thought it would be by this time. In his initial speeches about Starship, his initial presentations, which took place in 2016 at IAC, when he used to show up to IAC conferences, Elon talked about the following list of test flights for his iterative development of Starship, with flights 1 through 3 being early suborbital tests and low altitude hops, flight 4 through 6 with booster catch attempts and initial orbital flights without payload, flight 7 through 9 being orbital refueling tests in low Earth orbit. Yeah, flights 7 through 9 were supposed to be that, with flights 10 and 11 being more complex refueling, such as multiple tanker flights to the same starship and uncrewed orbital payload deliveries to low Earth orbit. Obviously, those things haven't happened at all yet, and even though I think Starship is eventually going to get there, this doesn't bode well for a 2026 unmanned Mars mission. As a matter of fact, that mission will be impossible, and even a 2028 unmanned mission is going to be quite a challenge. Why? I mean, aren't we getting to the point to where Starship is going to be able to make an orbital flight? I mean, it probably could have carried out an orbital flight by now. It's just the flight plan really didn't account for an orbital flight. I mean, once Starship actually gets to orbit, isn't orbital refueling going to follow rather quickly? Well, no, not at all. Let me explain why orbital refueling is a so-called hard mode challenge. SpaceX has done ground cryogenic shifts and intra-vehicle transfers such as an intra-vehicle 
fluid transfer that took place on IFT-3 in 2023, but zero gravity ship-to-ship fuel transfers involve number one, docking procedure, sub-millimeter alignment at 28,000 kilometers per hour relative velocity with sloshing propellants in both vehicles destabilizing them. Then you have cryogenic management, preventing boil off of methane and liquid oxygen during hours long transfers and then keeping it stored until the next refueling mission can come up. All of that is extremely challenging and the more boil off you have, the longer it's going to take to get a refueling completed. And then as far as scale is concerned, each tanker delivering about 100 metric tons to HLS Starship's tanks or to a Mars Starship's tanks requires 8 to 16 flights, minimum 8 flights if it can deliver 150 tons, but otherwise up to 16 or perhaps even more flights in order to carry out a successful refueling of one starship. That is a tall order considering that we haven't even gotten to the first refueling test yet. That's probably not going to happen until sometime later in 2026 after the first presumably successful test of Starship Block 3. And speaking of Starship Block 3, there's an ugly reality about Starship development that few people really talk about, but is absolutely true. Starship is not carrying the kind of payload up to orbit or even suborbital flight that it was supposed to be carrying. It was billed as being capable of carrying 100 metric tons pretty much right out of the gate. And up to this point, the heaviest payload that Starship has carried is is 16 metric tons, which is about the same that a Falcon Heavy can carry. As a matter of fact, substantially less. Starship really needs to improve dramatically as far as payload is concerned for it to be a viable replacement for anything, viable competition for most of the rockets out there. Because given the enormous amount of infrastructure and everything else that's required to launch a rocket that's this enormous and this powerful, it needs to carry enormous amounts of payload at the same time. And its only capability, at least as far as a single launch is concerned, is carrying lots of payload up to low Earth orbit. It can't carry lots of payload out to cislunar space, for example, the way Saturn V or SLS can. It can only carry a substantial amount of payload to low Earth orbit, and that's pretty much it, at least in its current design. Now granted, if Starship can actually reach this milestone, if it gets to the point where it can consistently and reliably carry 100 metric tons or even a little bit more up to orbit on a regular basis, it's going to revolutionize spaceflight in many ways. It can carry entire space stations up to orbit in a single launch. As a matter of fact, it's currently contracted to do just that for the Star Lab space station for Voyager and Airbus. And if it can do that for them, it can start deploying space stations for a wide variety of customers at a very, very low price. That will be revolutionary on a lot of levels. However, as far as Starship's most important goal, at least as far as Elon is concerned, making life interplanetary, Starship has to become interplanetary. And until those first refueling missions are carried out, until we get the slightest inkling as to how difficult this is actually going to be. All of that remains science fiction and Elon time. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And also, please don't miss the interview that I carried out with Voyager, actually the CEO of Voyager, about their Star Lab space station. I'm going to have that video linked at the end of this one, and I'll also link it in the description. Very interesting interview that gets a lot of insights as to what Starship might be able to do in low Earth orbit once it reaches its full potential. And don't forget the three I Atlas merchandise that we have in the store. It's only going to be there for a few more days. Don't miss out on your opportunity there. 
Thanks again for watching, and until next time, stay angry about space.